Good afternoon from my, well, actually, good morning from sunny Miami. This is Dr. John Bennett of InternetMedicine.com and in the Internet Medicine channel of Bright Talk. This is another in the series of uh, webinars with the subject of 3D printing in medicine, a, a growing dynamic field. And tonight, uh, and today we have the uh, honor of having uh, Eric Gattenholm, uh, originally from Sweden, who went to Virginia, and now he's back in Sweden with his company, Cell Links. And uh, Eric is going to introduce himself and his team. So welcome, Eric. It's all yours. Thank you, John. I really appreciate the chance and opportunity to speak. Um, so, uh, well, welcome everybody, and I hope everybody's uh, is doing well. Uh, my name is Eric Attenholm. I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Cell Inc. I'm sitting here with uh, Dr. Hector Martinez, uh, also co-founder and CTO, as well as Ida Hendrickson, our uh, Chief BioInc uh, Officer. So uh, we are we are delighted to uh, to start our presentation, and we're going to talk a lot about the commercialization and and the uh, more the commercial aspect as well as the scientific background behind what what uh, behind the success of selling. So uh, so uh, let's start with. Um, uh, we want to define first of all the need and the drive what what drives us behind this and uh, we say imagine a world where uh, where 21 patients are not waiting every day for an organ transplant and imagine a world where we could provide uh, dying patients with fully functional organs on demand we also want people to imagine a world where animals are no longer used for uh, for for research and, and trials of cosmetic or um, or drug discovery and the development of pharmaceutical products. Uh, our goal as, as a company is to one day be able to uh, to replace human fully functional human organs and want to transplant these into patients. To get to that point we believe that we need to climb basically a ladder of three steps and uh, we see ourselves being in the step today where we uh, provide solutions to cosmetic companies and the solutions that we provide is fully functional human skin for testing of new cosmetic products. The reason that this, um, uh, the reason that this technology and the reason that this um, need came up was from the European Union actually. They, they banned the use of animal trials and animal studies uh, 2013. This ban is significant for, for the development of cosmetic products, especially in Europe. Uh, because now there must be other alternatives, and these alternatives were, were essentially non-existent. Uh, we've seen a lot of cosmetic and cosmetic uh, cosmetic and um, and research corporations moving towards the utilization and the adoption of 3D bioprinting in their product development uh, approaches. And we see ourselves being one of the key members and one of the key providers of services and products, especially for this uh, this industry. So, so we want to talk also a little bit about how is this possible and, and, and what is it that we really do uh, as, a, as a small business, a small startup uh, stemming out of Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, we, have, we, also see, we are a startup a spin-off from Chalmers Te um, University of Technology. Um, and uh, we started basically as a, a company that focused on a technology uh, based on a biomaterial innovation. So, so we had a an innovative material that was was invented or or, or, or uh, was mixed in um, at Chalmers University, and this technology and material was was funded by by the by by Eurostar project basically and and um, by the Swedish Swedish government, and uh, it was to to come up with an optimal biomaterial or so called an bio ink for the production of human cartilage. Now this is an ex ex extremely exciting area, and we've been working with this for for several years, and we finally come to a point where uh, it's a commercial, uh, it's a commercial viable, it's a viable product for for commercial applications where you want to produce uh, cartilage and and um, and other human tissue models, obviously for uh, for use both in pharmaceutical as well as uh, cosmetic applications. Uh, the process, the way the, that it works, is, is quite simple. It's quite simple to explain to people to understand, but we're, we're going to try to explain it to, to people who may not understand how the 3D bioprinting uh, process works. So, so first of all, you start off with a 3D, uh, 3D computer model, a CAD model, of the tissue that you want to print. And in this case, as you see on the slide, you want to start off with 
a, um, a human ear, a, a CAD model of a human ear. And um, the next thing you want to do is say you want to provide, um, you want to have a biomaterial which you mix in the human cells together with. So you have uh, human chondrocytes, uh, patient specific preferably, and you mix them in together with the um, uh, with the bioink, uh, the cell ink bioink, which we've developed, and then you provide, you put this into the printer, and you provide the printers with the coordinates, which are um, made up from the from the ear biocad model, and then you basically hit print on our system, and this and our printer will print out the human tissue, print out the the ear according to what the three D model has shown, as well as with the human cells and the patient-specific human cells. And once this structure has been printed, uh, a few weeks will be, will be passed in the laboratory when these cells are seeded and, and, and eventually this ear is ready for, for um, transplantation. So, so just small, small on the, a little bit on the commercial side. So, so Cellink was the first um, a universal bioink for 3D bioprinting. We commercialize this bioink um, as a product for for multiple different uh, bioprinter platforms, um, and essentially, it's been um, it's been a tremendous progress on the biomaterial side to provide an environment for human cells to 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 proliferate and and, and start secreting the hormones that they need to do and, and the tissue. We've done a lot of in-house testing and, and development on our on our uh, selling bioink to make sure that we provide the customers with a with a full solution in this bioink so that it can be a reliable and high quality product. In addition to that, we also have the world's most cost-effective 3D bioprinter. Uh, with that being said, we provide uh, universities, corporations, and other research institutions today with a bioprinter for only four thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. Uh, the reason we do this is because we believe that uh, by providing all institutions and everybody, all every single lab in the world with, with our bioprinter, we can move the process to being able to produce fully functional human organs much faster. So with everybody doing this and everybody having access to technology, we can truly make the world come together and make our dream possible. So. In addition to this, we also believe that we need to provide customers with a complete solution, as I mentioned. And, and doing that, that means that we need to build the infrastructure and, and, and provide them with everything that's, that's required for them to, to have models in, at hand, to have human cells, to have, um, to have the printing capabilities, et cetera, in-house. So, so we were the first ones in the world to actually launch a bio-library uh, community, uh, which we call Bioverse. Bioverse is a online open source platform where, um, where research labs and, and research institutions will be able to go in and download different BioCAD models. Uh, for instance, let's say a, a surgeon out in, in, in Florida or Miami, where you are, John, uh, would like to print a human ear. He should be able to just go into Bioverse um, and um, Bioverse.co and, um, and download this, this human model on demand and then print it out with his incredible bioprinter. So, so as I mentioned, we, today we offer human cells and we are in a partnership with Rooster Bio uh, to provide uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, we also provide the CAD models, uh, the printers, the bioink, as well as the, bio, uh, the BioCAD community. Uh, we want to provide customers with one simple solutions so they can start printing human tissue right out of the box when they buy their printer. And this business model is, is based really on the simple fact that the more people that can work with this, the faster we will save these 21 patients to die every day. So now Hector, uh, actually Ida, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Ida will talk more about uh, the development of, of, of our bioing. Yes, um, okay. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we need to identify which properties we want to have in our bioink or uh, we require for the printing. Uh, so we have two big uh, properties that we are looking at and it's the printing fidelity 
which is related to the gelation, the viscosity, uh, and the nozzle that we're using for the printer. Uh, here the viscosity is very important uh, because if you have a too high viscosity, uh, you need a very high pressure for, uh, for the material to be dispensed. And that is not uh, good for the cells. Um, and if you have a too low viscosity, it just pours out and you can't get a good resolution of your uh, printing. Um, and the gelation uh, are related to uh, also related to the uh, to the cell viability and the cell prol proliferation uh, and differentiation because you when you print uh, and structure you want the cells to stay in your material uh, and proliferate in inside there so you have to cap capture them um, in uh, in a certain way <clears throat> and so the uh, the cell is, is the other big property that you need to have. You need to have a cell uh, compar comparability. Um, and related to, to this is the network properties, the fabrication time, uh, and also the shear stress, um, which is related to, to the nozzle uh, used and also uh, the viscosity, since I mentioned about the pressure. Um, the pressure gives the material more shear stress, uh, which also applies to the to the cells, uh, and the cells die. Um, and so the fabrication time uh, are related to the nozzle that you're using. Um, because when you print uh, fast, you have to pour uh, material out, uh, much material out also. Um, so if you think it's as pouring ketchup all over your food, if you do it fast, it's uh, just getting everywhere. But if you uh, like uh, put a more pressure on the bottle when you're uh, pouring it out, uh, you get a nicer print, so to say, over your food. Uh, okay, so yeah, so how do we find this? Um, first of all, we need to look at the rheology uh, of, uh, of different bioink materials. Uh, and here we have alginate, which is a cross-linkable material, but it doesn't have these shear thinning uh, properties. On the other hand, the nanocellulose have these shear thinning properties. Um, so in the end, when we mix them, we get cell link and uh, we get the <coughs> shear thinning material, uh, which is cross-linkable. Um, which And this uh, cross-linking encapture the cells. Uh, making the gelation happen. So here is some pictures of the uh, of the, resol the resolution that we can get with the with the, the cell ink. Uh, we have an ear, uh, for example, and some grids, and uh, uh, also uh, um, uh, meniscus. meniscus. And on the uh, left, uh, we compare different uh, uh, concentrations of uh, alginate uh, and also with uh, with selling uh, on on the printability. And we see that the printability is much higher with selling uh, comparing to uh, alginate alone. And uh, in the beginning, uh, beginning I also talked about the uh, biocomparability. And so here we have the results from the, the cytotoxicity, um, and cell link is classified as a 
non cytotoxic uh, hydrogel uh, bioink according to ISO standard uh, 109935. Uh, and this is with uh, fibroblasts. Um, the negative control that we used here was uh, 20% DMSO. The positive control. Oh, no, uh, the positive control. And the negative control was? Feral uh, plastic. Cell culture insufficient. Cell culture insufficient. That is sterile. Uh, we can clearly see that um, uh, that cell ink is non toxic. Uh, on the screen. Okay. Mm, so uh, when we look at applications for cell ink, um, we wanted to do a collaboration with Rooster Bio to print with uh, stem cells. Uh, and here we use human uh, MSC cells. Um, which we mixed with the, the bio ink and printed with two different printers. Our is the one that is orange, uh, and it reached uh, or it uh, provides 97% cell viability compared to 71% uh, with the other printer, um, which have a different technology. And now Hector is going to talk about the application. Okay, thank you for the invitation. And um, so we have, uh, Ida has gone over, has shown that we have a bioing that has excellent printability. It's non-cytotoxic. Uh, in terms of resolution, it can achieve uh, very fine strands. And uh, looking more at the 3D models that can be uh, built using this bioing. You can see that the, the printing fidelity is very, very high. But how about how does it respond in uh, in vitro when you use uh, human chondrocytes, for example? So we looked at the application of using this uh, bioink in cartilage tissue engineering, and the results I will show you. They have some of them have been published, and uh, some of them are under review for publication. So. Let's see. Before before I go into uh, into the results we get from the in vitro study, I will guide you, show you how it's. Uh, let's see. I I have I had an animation in this in this uh, slide, but uh, I cannot see it. But anyways, so we're using patient data to create personalized ear implants, and this process looks as follow follows. We take MRI data from the patient, and this is what we call a blueprint. From these images, we do image segmentation and 3D reconstruction of the ear. And from this data, we can prepare a model for 3D printing. Uh, now, this, this uh, printing protocol can be, can be used for printing uh, human, uh, human ears, person, patients, patient-specific ear implants, and together with cell link mixed with, um, with this chondrocytes and uh, using uh, our bioprinter, we can, uh, we can create these structures like the ones you, uh, Ida showed you before. Uh, okay, so the printing of... Um, so in this study that you see here, wait, are we missing? Okay, yeah, in the study that you see here, we printed porous uh, chondrocyte laden ear construct using a cell ink as a bio ink. And in this case, we encapsulate the human nasal chondrocytes in cell ink and using Region U 3D uh, Discovery Bioprinter. We printed these uh, porous constructs and cultured them for uh, for four weeks in vitro. Uh, this work that you that you're about to see has been submitted uh, for publication. Uh, we see that the cell viability of the chondrocytes uh, 
before and after printing, it's uh, uh, relatively the same, meaning that the chondrocytes were, uh, are not affected by the uh, significant significantly affected by the bioprinting system. And more important, we see that the cell viability increases uh, during uh, the 3D culture period. Uh, from these images that you see here, the red stain will mean that uh, will stain positive uh, for dead cells, and the green stain, green color, that is uh, shows the cells which are alive in the material. You see that there is a very homogeneous uh, distribution of living cells in the material. And also, you see that the, uh, the number of uh, dead cells decreases over time in culture, up to 28 days. So this gave us a pretty good indication on the cell viability. But how about the uh, cell proliferation and neocartilage synthesis? So the way it looked is that what we found is that after 28 uh, days of 3D culture, there was a significant increase in cell, uh, in cell number per scaffold. And also, this same uh, cell proliferation resulted in an increase of uh, glycosaminoglycan production by the cells normalized per scaffold. When it comes to uh, the matrix production, uh, the cells are definitely producing uh, matrix in the, in the bioink. So we looked at uh, regular histology and immunohistochemistry, and we found that after 14 days, the cells have, had already produced glycosaminoglycans, uh, agrican, and collagen type 2, which are uh, markers for cartilage, uh, found in cartilage tissue. And we saw that after 28 days, this, this production had increased uh, much more. You see that uh, chondrocytes are uh, able, to, able to move in the material, in the bioink, as seen by the cell aggregates that you see in the lower uh, left corner at day 20, 28 for the, for the glycosaminoglycan stain uh, slides. Uh, we see that the cells aggregate and uh, we see a higher concentration stain positively for uh, GACs. When it comes to agrican and type 2 collagen, this production also increases. And uh, that's just, uh, that this gives us an idea of the, uh, the, sup the, sup uh, the biological activity of this um, bioink that you know, not only supports chondrocytes in a 3D network, but also uh, it supports the, their redifferentiation capacity and production of cartilage-specific uh, proteins. Here we, uh, we see an overall picture of um, ash and blue staining showing the glycosaminoglycans in the, in the porous uh, 3D printed construct with uh, nasal sets of chondrocytes. We see a very homogeneous distribution of these uh, glycosaminoglycans all over the scaffold. And we also see that, uh, you know, the, uh, some cell, uh, cell aggregates in the material, meaning that the cells can, can move inside the material. And this is uh, for after 28 days of 3D culture. So to summarize, uh, we, we have demonstrated that selling is a non-cytotoxic biomaterial uh, which offers excellent printability, high sh shape fidelity, and it's also a biologically relevant 3D environment for chondrocytes. Uh, besides facilitating bioprinting of complex 3D structures like a human ear, uh, these uh, cell laden constructs have control density and also porosity. Uh, depending on the on the technology that you use for bioprinting, but the and of course the this uh, selling uh, selling as a bioink it supports viable cells, uh, not only in in short term culture but also in long term three D culture, 
and we have shown you that neocartilage formation uh, is seen. Uh, it's, it's produced by, uh, neocartilage is produced by chondrocytes in vitro. Uh, so with that in mind, I would like to thank you for, for listening. And uh, this, this is the rest of the, this is the selling uh, team. Okay, thank you. Very, oh, I'm sorry, am I interrupting you? Yeah, one second, one second, yeah, before we. Yeah, so we just have a few more, uh, just a few more slides, actually. Yeah. So, hey, so, going back, no so going back to the, uh, um, to the commercial aspect of selling and, and what makes us kind of an exciting company, we need to, we need to get to the point where, where what Hector is talking about in EDA, you know, we need to get to the point of being able to produce fully functional human organs and, 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 and body parts. But it's, I think, and everybody understands, there's a long way left. And um, at this early stage, there's a lot of financing that needs to be made. There's a lot of decisions, both governmental, uh, regulatory policies, and, and, uh, and changes in how we kind of perceive the entire industry of, of additive manufacturing. Um, uh, some of the work that FDA has to do is to determine whether uh, three bioprinted implants and organs will will be allowed to be implanted into humans, how will they be categorized, will they be class 2B devices, will they be class 3, um, the manufacturing regulations and manufacturing procedures must be developed, um, and we certainly have a lot of lot of insight and a lot of experience with, with these uh, regulations at Cell Inc., but those are things that the entire industry must work, uh, work with. So for us to be able to get to a point where we have implantable devices and, in, uh, and implants into humans, we need to finance our operations, and, and the way we're doing it today is we're basically selling 80% uh, of our customers are universities and research institutions. And we truly appreciate all our customers within this segment, uh, and we believe that there is there's strong collaborations with every single one of our customers. Um, this is a this is a very new technology, and, and we will we will have to work very closely with all our customers to learn how how to further it. Um, but with that being said, we're, we truly appreciate the ones that are uh, the innovators and the early adopters of this. So, uh, so with that being said, I, I would like to thank everybody for their attention, and uh, please feel free to follow us at uh, Selling 3D uh, on Twitter and and uh, just Selling on Facebook, and visit our website Selling.eu or uh, Selling3D.com. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can always fill out any of those forms on the website or, or shoot us an email. So uh, thank you very much. And, and John, once again, we appreciate the opportunity of, of, of speaking today. Great. Thanks, uh, Eric and the team. Uh, you guys are quite a bunch, and uh, I think it's probably a good place to uh, – you guys have a good time working together. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is an excellent presentation, well-illustrated, great slides. You know, in, a, in an industry where, uh, you know, most people don't know what's behind the 3D printing, and it's good to get some insight uh, in, into that area. And we look forward to working with you guys in the future. Um, you know, just a couple of comments. Uh, uh, I don't know if you saw the uh, webinar by John Hornick, the gentleman who wrote a book, 3D Will Rock the World. Uh, yeah. he, he, he says the big big uh, stimulus actually for widespread acceptance of 3D printers. Can you guys guess what it, what it is? Mm. What he says it is. He says, no, he says children. He says children. Children will, will yeah. be the ones that once the kids start telling the parents, hey, uh, Joe down the block has a 3D printer. I want one too. Uh, because he predicts, uh, like you guys probably know about, that within five to ten years that most households will have a 3D printer uh, in their house, just like they have computers. Now, you guys are kind of young, but I don't know if you remember the days, like 20 years ago, uh, I don't know, Bill Gates or Stephen Jobs or whoever said this, he said, someday every house is going to have a computer. And people thought they were nuts, but look at what's happening today. Most households have three or four, so uh, I think that's certainly on the horizon. And you guys seem to have a, a great future with the production of uh, 3D printers.
And, and that so, I have to add that I would like to add that that same model applies to to us right now, as you mentioned. That you know, when when the the real in innovations will come when every lab, every institution has access to 3D bioprinting, has a bioprinter in the lab. You know, the more the more people that get involved, that's when we will see the the, the breakthrough in this uh, in this uh, you know re research field, and we will see um, you know close things close to miracles happening once. Uh, all the researchers get involved, as many researchers as possible get involved in this exciting field, and you know, just pushing regenerative medicine forward. Uh, bioprinting is a very promising uh, technology for that, and uh, we we wish to be, uh, you know, to to empower scientists because you know, mm -hmm. scientists are the innovators. We can provide them with with a platform to start uh, innovating. Yeah, we have a few discussions with uh, other uh, 3D cell uh, scientists about, uh, and one is a friend of yours, Marcy, in Zurich with the cartilage, and there's been other uh, presenters that talked about production of cartilage, uh, et cetera. It certainly, certainly is exciting, and I'm surprised, too, from interacting with uh, uh, various hospitals, the number of 3D printers that they have in laboratories, but not so much for borrowed printing, for, but for printing out parts to the machines that break down. Exactly. You guys probably know about, you guys know about that, right? Because as you know, 3D printing is more than just science and medicine, it's manufacturing too. If you have a part that breaks down in your machine, 3D printer machine or whatever, any other laboratory machine, you can print it out without sending to the manufacturer. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So, and the same thing applies for building or building human parts. You know, we, we will get there. It's just a matter of uh, a scientists adopting the technology, uh, researching, and, you know, it's, it's doable. It's, it's in, in our lifetime. We, I can see that happening in our lifetime. Well, we look forward to the breaking developments and uh, growing with you guys. And I look forward to uh, having you in the community of 3D printing and medicine and possibly having more uh, more webinars in the Bright Talk interface. So we thank you for coming out. And I don't know how you say goodbye in Swedish. How do you say goodbye in Swedish? Hey, Ro. Okay. Okay, <laughs> and, 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 and hang around after. I'll talk to you guys later. Sounds good. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Okay, Bye. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. We'll end the presentation now. Thank you. Thank you.